a Wikivide Documentaries production. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Enjoy. Bob Dylan Bob Dylan is an American singer-songwriter, author, and painter, who has been an influential figure in popular music and culture for more than five decades. Much of his most celebrated work dates from the 1960s, when he became a reluctant voice of a generation, with songs such as Blowin' in the Wind and The Times They Are A-Changing, that became anthems for the civil rights movement and anti-war movement. In 1965, he controversially abandoned his early fan base in the American folk music revival, recording a six-minute single, Like a Rolling Stone, which enlarged the scope of popular music. Dylan's lyrics incorporate a wide range of political, social, philosophical, and literary influences. They defied existing pop music conventions and appealed to the burgeoning counterculture. Initially inspired by the performances of Little Richard and the songwriting of Woody Guthrie, Robert Johnson, and Hank Williams, Dylan has amplified and personalized musical genres. In his recording career, Dylan has explored many of the traditions in American song, from folk, blues, and country to gospel, and rock and roll, and, from rockabilly to English, Scottish, and Irish folk music, embracing even jazz in the great American songbook. Dylan performs on guitar, keyboards, and harmonica. Backed by a changing lineup of musicians, he has toured steadily since the late 1980s on what has been dubbed, the never-ending tour. His accomplishments as a recording artist and performer have been central to his career, but his songwriting is considered his greatest contribution. Following his self-titled debut album in 1962, which mainly consisted of traditional folk songs, Dylan made his breakthrough as a songwriter, with the release of the 1963 album The Free Wheel and Bob Dylan, featuring Blowin' in the Wind, and the thematically complex composition A Hard Rain's Are Gonna Fall, alongside several other enduring songs of the era. Dylan went on to release the politically charged The Times They Are A-Changing and the more lyrically abstract and introspective Another Side of Bob Dylan in 1964. In 1965 and 1966 Dylan encountered controversy when he adopted the use of electrically amplified rock instrumentation and in the space of 15 months recorded three of the most important and influential rock albums of the 1960s, bringing it have all back home, Highway 61 revisited and Blonde on Blonde. In July 1966, Dylan withdrew from touring after being injured in a motorcycle accident. During this period he recorded a large body of songs with members of the band, who had previously backed Dylan on tour. These were eventually released as the collaborative album The Basement Tapes in 1975, in the late 1960s and early 70s, Dylan explored country music and rural themes in John Wesley Harding, Nashville Skyline, and New Morning. In 1975 Dylan released his career-defining album Blood on the Tracks followed by the critically and commercially successful Desire the following year. In the late 1970s, Dylan became a born-again Christian and released a series of albums of contemporary gospel music, notably Slow Train Coming before returning to his more familiar rock-based idiom with infidels. Dylan's major works during his later career include Time Out of Mind, Love and Theft, and Tempest. His most recent recordings have comprised versions of traditional American standards, especially songs recorded by Frank Sinatra. Since 1994, Dylan has published seven books of drawings and paintings, and his work has been exhibited in major art galleries. Dylan has sold more than 100 million records, making him one of the best-selling music artists of all time. He has also received numerous awards including 11 Grammy Awards, a Golden Globe Award, and an Academy Award. Dylan has been inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, Minnesota Music Hall of Fame, Nashville Songwriters Hall of Fame, and Songwriters Hall of Fame. The Pulitzer Prize jury in 2008 awarded him a special citation for his profound impact on popular music and American culture, marked by lyrical compositions of extraordinary poetic power. In May 2012, Dylan received the Presidential Medal of Freedom from President Barack Obama, and, in 2016, he was awarded the Nobel Prize in Literature for having created new poetic expressions within the great American song tradition origins and musical beginnings. Bob Dylan was born Robert Allen Zimmerman in St. Mary's Hospital on May 24, 1941. 
in Duluth, Minnesota, and raised in Hibbing, Minnesota, on the Mesabi Range west of Lake Superior. He has a younger brother, David. Dylan's paternal grandparents, Zygmunt and Anna Zimmerman, emigrated from Odessa, in the Russian Empire, to the United States following the anti-Semitic pogroms of 1905. His maternal grandparents, Ben and Florence Stone, were Lithuanian Jews who arrived in the United States in 1902. In his autobiography, Chronicles, Volume 1, Dylan wrote that his paternal grandmother's maiden name was Kerr Is and her family originated from the Kagesman district of Kars province in northeastern Turkey. Dylan's father, Abram Zimmerman an electric appliance shop owner and mother, Beatrice, Beatty, Stone, were part of a small, close-knit Jewish community. They lived in Duluth until Robert was six, when his father had polio, and the family returned to his mother's hometown, Hibbing, where they lived for the rest of Robert's childhood. In his early years he listened to the radio, first to blues and country stations from Shreveport, Louisiana, and later, when he was a teenager, to rock and roll. He formed several bands while attending Hibbing High School. In the Golden Chords, he performed covers of songs by Little Richard and Elvis Presley. Their performance of Danny and the Juniors, Rock and Roll is Here to Stay, at their high school talent show was so loud that the principal cut the microphone. On January 31, 1959, three days before his death, Buddy Holly performed at the Duluth Armory. Seventeen-year-old Zimmerman was in the audience. In his Nobel Prize lecture, Dylan remembered. He looked me right straight dead in the eye, and he transmitted something. Something I didn't know what. And it gave me the chills. In 1959, his high school yearbook carried the caption, Robert Zimmerman, to join Little Richard. The same year, as Elston Gunn, he performed two dates, with Bobby V, playing piano and clapping. In September 1959, Zimmerman moved to Minneapolis and enrolled at the University of Minnesota. His focus on rock and roll gave way to American folk music. In 1985, he said, Living at the Jewish-centric fraternity Sigma Alpha Mu House Zimmerman began to perform at the Ten O'Clock Scholar, a coffee house a few blocks from campus, and became involved in the Dinkytown folk music circuit. During his Dinkytown days, Zimmerman began introducing himself as Bob Dylan. In his memoir, he said he hit upon using this less common variant for Dylan a surname he had considered adopting, when he unexpectedly saw some poems by Dylan Thomas. Explaining his change of name in a 2004 interview, Dylan remarked, You're born, you know. The wrong names, wrong parents. I mean, that happens. You call yourself what you want to call yourself. This is the land of the free. Relocation to New York and record deal. In May 1960, Dylan dropped out of college at the end of his first year. In January 1961, he traveled to New York City to perform there and visit his musical idol Woody Guthrie, who was seriously ill with Huntington's disease in Greystone Park Psychiatric Hospital. Guthrie had been a revelation to Dylan and influenced his early performances. Describing Guthrie's impact, he wrote, The songs themselves had the infinite sweep of humanity in them. He was the true voice of the American spirit. I said to myself I was going to be Guthrie's greatest disciple. As well as visiting Guthrie in hospital, Dylan befriended Guthrie's protege rambling Jack Elliott. Much of Guthrie's repertoire was channeled through Elliott, and Dylan paid tribute to Elliott in Chronicles, Volume 1. From February 1961, Dylan played at clubs around Greenwich Village, befriending and picking up material from folk singers there, including Dave Van Ronk, Fred Neal, Odetta, the new Lost City Ramblers and Irish musicians the Clancy Brothers and Tommy Maycomb. New York Times critic Robert Shelton first noted Dylan in a review of Izzy Young's production for WRVR of a live 12-hour Hootenanny on July 29, 1961. Among the newer promising talents deserving mention are a 20-year-old Latter-day Guthrie disciple named Bob Dylan. With a curiously arresting mumbling, country-steeped manner, this was Dylan's first live radio performance. In September, Shelton boosted Dylan's career further with a very enthusiastic review of his performance at Gerda's Folk City. The same month Dylan played harmonica on folk singer Caroline Hester's third album. This brought his talents to the attention of the album's producer, John Hammond, who signed Dylan to Columbia Records. 
The performances on his first Columbia album, Bob Dylan, released March 19, 1962, consisted of familiar folk, blues and gospel with two original compositions. The album sold only 5,000 in its first year, just enough to break even. Within Columbia Records, some referred to the singer as Hammond's Folly, and suggested dropping his contract, but Hammond defended Dylan, and was supported by Johnny Cash. In March 1962, Dylan contributed harmonica and backup vocals to the album Three Kings and the Queen, accompanying Victoria Spivey and Big Joe Williams on a recording for Spivey Records. While working for Columbia, Dylan recorded under the pseudonym Blind Boy Grunt for Broadside, a folk magazine and record label. Dylan used the pseudonym Bob Landy to record as a piano player on the Blues Project, a 1964 anthology album by Elektra Records. As Tiedem Porter House, Dylan played harmonica on Rambling Jack Elliott's 1964 album Jack Elliott. Dylan made two important career moves in August 1962, he legally changed his name to Robert Dylan, and he signed a management contract with Albert Grossman. Grossman remained Dylan's manager until 1970, and was notable for his sometimes confrontational personality and for protective loyalty. Dylan said, he was kind of like a Colonel Tom Parker figure. You could smell him coming. Tensions between Grossman and John Hammond led to Hammond's being replaced as producer of Dylan's second album by the young African-American jazz producer, Tom Wilson. Dylan made his first trip to the United Kingdom from December 1962 to January 1963. He had been invited by TV director Philip Saville to appear in a drama, Madhouse on Castle Street, which Saville was directing for BBC television. At the end of the play, Dylan performed Blowin' in the Wind, one of its first public performances. The film recording of Madhouse on Castle Street was destroyed by the BBC in 1968. While in London, Dylan performed at London folk clubs, including The Troubadour, Lay Cousins, and Bungees. He also learned material from UK performers, including Martin Carthy. By the time of Dylan's second album, The Free Wheel and Bob Dylan, in May 1963, he had begun to make his name as a singer and a songwriter. Many songs on this album were labeled protest songs, inspired partly by Guthrie and influenced by Pete Seeger's passion for topical songs. Oxford Town, for example, was an account of James Meredith's ordeal as the first black student to risk enrollment at the University of Mississippi. The first song on the Free Wheelin' album, Blowin' in the Wind, partly derived its melody from the traditional slave song, No More Auction Block. While its lyrics questioned the social and political status quo, the song was widely recorded by other artists and became a hit for Peter, Paul, and Mary. Another free wheel and song, A Hard Rain's A Gonna Fall, was based on the folk ballad, Lord Randall. With veiled references to an impending apocalypse, the song gained more resonance. When the Cuban Missile Crisis developed a few weeks after Dylan began performing it, like, Blowing in the wind, a hard rains are gonna fall, marked a new direction in songwriting, blending a stream of consciousness, imagist lyrical attack with traditional folk form. Dylan's topical songs enhanced his early reputation, and he came to be seen as more than just a songwriter. Janet Maslin wrote of Free Wheelin', these were the songs that established Dylan as the voice of his generation, someone who implicitly understood how concerned young Americans felt about nuclear disarmament and the growing civil rights movement. His mixture of moral authority and non-conformity was perhaps the most timely of his attributes. Free We Lane also included love songs and surreal talking blues. Humor was an important part of Dylan's persona, and the range of material on the album impressed listeners, including the Beatles. George Harrison said of the album, we just played it, just wore it out. The content of the song lyrics, and just the attitude, it was incredibly original and wonderful. The rough edge of Dylan's singing was unsettling to some, but an attraction to others. Joyce Carol Oates wrote, When we first heard this raw, very young, and seemingly untrained voice, frankly nasal, as if sandpaper could sing, the effect was dramatic and electrifying. Many early songs reached the public through more palatable versions by other performers, such as Joan Baez, who became Dylan's advocate as well as his lover. Baez was influential in bringing Dylan to prominence by recording several of his early songs and inviting him on stage during her concerts. It didn't take long before people got it that he was pretty damned special, says Baez. 
Others who had hits with Dylan's songs in the early 1960s included The Birds, Sonny, and Cher. The Hollies, Peter, Paul, and Mary, The Association, Manfred Mann and the Turtles. Most attempted a pop feel and rhythm, while Dylan and Wise performed them mostly as sparse folk songs. The covers became so ubiquitous that CBS promoted him with a slogan, Nobody Sings Dylan Like Dylan, Mixed Up Confusion, recorded during the Free Wheel and Sessions with a backing band, was released as a single, and then quickly withdrawn. In contrast to the mostly solo acoustic performances on the album, the single showed a willingness to experiment with a rockabilly sound. Cameron Crowe described it as, a fascinating look at a folk artist with his mind wandering towards Elvis Presley and Son Records. Protest and Another Side In May 1963, Dylan's political profile rose when he walked out of the Ed Sullivan show. During rehearsals, Dylan had been told by CBS Television's head of program practices that talking John Birch paranoid blues was potentially libelous to the John Birch Society. Rather than comply with censorship, Dylan refused to appear. By this time, Dylan and Byers were prominent in the civil rights movement, singing together. At the March on Washington on August 28, 1963, Dylan's third album, The Times They Are A-Changing, reflected a more politicized Dylan. The songs often took as their subject matter contemporary stories, with only a pawn in their game, addressing the murder of civil rights worker Medgar Evers, and the breaching, the lonesome death of Hattie Carroll, the death of black hotel barmaid Hattie Carroll, at the hands of young white socialite William Zantzinger. On a more general theme, Ballad of Hollis Brown, and North Country Blues, addressed despair engendered by the breakdown of farming and mining communities. This political material was accompanied by two personal love songs, Boots of Spanish Leather, and One Too Many Mornings. During the Nashville Skyline Sessions in 1969, Dylan and Johnny Cash recorded a duet of the song which has not been released. By the end of 1963, Dylan felt both manipulated and constrained by the folk and protest movements. Accepting the Tom Paine Award from the National Emergency Civil Liberties Committee shortly after the assassination of John F. Kennedy, an intoxicated Dylan questioned the role of the committee, characterized the members as old and balding, and claimed to see something of himself and of every man in Kennedy's assassin, Lee Harvey Oswald. Another side of Bob Dylan, recorded on a single evening in June 1964, had a lighter mood. The humorous Dylan re-emerged on I Shall Be Free No. 10, and Motorcycle Nightmare, Spanish Harlem Incident, and To Ramona, a passionate love songs, while Black Crow Blues, and I Don't Believe You, suggest the rock and roll soon to dominate Dylan's music. It Ain't Me Babe, on the surface a song about spurned love, has been described as a rejection of the role of political spokesman thrust upon him. His newest direction was signaled by two lengthy songs, the impressionistic Chimes of Freedom, which sets social commentary against a metaphorical landscape in a style characterized by Allen Ginsberg as Chains of Flashing Images, and My Back Pages, which attacks the simplistic and arch seriousness of his own earlier topical songs and seems to predict the backlash he was about to encounter from his former champions as he took a new direction. In the latter half of 1964 and into 1965, Dylan moved from folk songwriter to folk rock pop music star. His jeans and work shirts were replaced by a Carnaby Street wardrobe, sunglasses day or night, and pointed beetle boots. A London reporter wrote, hair that would set the teeth of a comb on edge, a loud shirt that would dim the neon lights of Leicester Square. He looks like an undernourished cockatoo. Dylan began to spar with interviewers, appearing on the Lay Crane television show and asked about a movie he planned. He told Crane it would be a cowboy horror movie, asked if he played the cowboy. Dylan replied, No, I play my mother. Going Electric Dylan's late March 1965 album Bringing It Have All Back Home was another leap, featuring his first recordings with electric instruments. The first single, Subterranean Homesick Blues, owed much to Chuck Berry's Too Much Monkey Business. Its free association lyrics described as hearkening back to the energy of beat poetry and as a forerunner of rap and hip-hop. 
the song was provided with an early video, which opened D.A. Penner Baker's Cinema Verite presentation of Dylan's 1965 tour of Great Britain, Don't Look Back, instead of miming. Dylan illustrated the lyrics by throwing cue cards containing key words from the song on the ground. Penner Baker said the sequence was Dylan's idea, and it has been imitated in music videos and advertisements. The second side of Bringing It Have All Back Home contained four long songs on which Dylan accompanied himself on acoustic guitar and harmonica. Mr. Tambourine Man became one of his best-known songs when the Birds recorded an electric version that reached number one in the US and UK. It's All Over Now, Baby Blue, and It's All Right Ma, were two of Dylan's most important compositions. In 1965, headlining the Newport Folk Festival, Dylan performed his first electric set since high school, with a pickup group featuring Mike Bloomfield on guitar and Al Cooper on organ. Dylan had appeared at Newport in 1963 and 1964, but in 1965 met with cheering and booing and left the stage after three songs. One version has it that the boos were from folk fans whom Dylan had alienated by appearing, unexpectedly, with an electric guitar. Murray Lerner, who filmed the performance, said, I absolutely think that they were booing Dylan going electric. An alternative account claims audience members were upset by poor sound and a short set. This account is supported by Cooper and one of the directors of the festival, who reports his recording proves the only boos were in reaction to the MC's announcement that there was only enough time for a short set. Nevertheless, Dylan's performance provoked a hostile response from the folk music establishment. In the September issue of Sing Out, Ewan McCall wrote, Our traditional songs and ballads are the creations of extraordinarily talented artists working inside disciplines formulated over time. But what of Bobby Dylan? Scream the outraged teenagers. Only a completely non critical audience, nourished on the watery pap of pop music, could have fallen for such tenth rate drivel. On July 29, four days after Newport, Dylan was back in the studio in New York, recording. Positively 4th Street. The lyrics contained images of vengeance and paranoia, and it has been interpreted as Dylan's put down of former friends from the folk community, friends he had known in clubs along West 4th Street. Brought to you by Wikividi Documentaries. Would you like to know more?